It's our nation's pastime, and just as our nation was once segregated by race, so was baseball. While Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig played in the majors, players like Josh Gibson and Leroy Satchel Page played in the Negro Leagues. They were stars in their own right then, but when the major league's color barrier was finally broken, Negro League baseball faded away into the shadows of history. Today, those players who helped pave the way for modern black athletes are still remembered for their talent, their courage, and their perseverance. It may be only a game, but it is America's game. And once, for the first half of the last century, it was actually two games, one for white America and one for black America, the major leagues and the Negro Leagues. We was accepted to play ball, but we couldn't eat in the restaurants, we couldn't live in the hotels, and most times we played and rolled, we left, keep going. But the love for the game overshadowed that. It was very important. A lot of, if it wasn't for the Negro League, a lot of black men would have never got a chance to play baseball. By 1920, blacks had been barred from competing in baseball's major leagues for some 20 years. It was then that team owners like Andrew Rube Foster and others formed the first organized Negro Leagues. Some of the league's former stars recently visited Alachua County as part of Cox Communications' Negro Baseball League project to promote diversity. They received proclamations from the county commission declaring May Negro Baseball League Month and shared the stories of past glories and hardships barnstorming the country, playing against all comers, and with and against some of the legends of the game. The team I was playing with, the Indianapolis Clowns, we played every day. The Negro League didn't go every day, but uh, for some reason, the owner of our team, he wanted his team to continue playing, playing, playing. And, uh, but we played league games on the weekend, and it, it, was, it was pretty nice. Very nice, and like I say, we played every day. Most of those teams we played every day was factory teams in those big cities. The constant travel across a segregated nation was tough on the players. Well, we couldn't go to a restaurant and eat with the guys. You know, we had to go to our down the road to our restaurant and eat. And most time we couldn't go to hotels, you know, and everything like that. Sometimes we would uh, sleep in a bed four hours in a one week. We get a chance to sleep in a bed four hours. Just uh, eat on the bus, change on the bus, hit the road, hit the road. It was pretty rough, especially that traveling thing. We had some good times and some bad times. Uh, we couldn't stop some time traveling. We used a restroom, uh, even get gas. We helped stop and they wouldn't even let us have gas. They didn't serve black people. And we had to try to make it to another town, hoping we didn't run out of gas. And when they arrived at the ballpark, they were often greeted with stinging racism. We would go to the ballpark in Texas and they call us all kind of names and stuff. And uh, it, it was kind of hard to get used to this. They tried to degrade you, but you just played. I call you, you can't hit some of your black SOB, and you get up there and hit one up against the fence, and then you can stand up and laugh at him, you know. And sometimes they were greeted with more than just hostile words. Uh, even the Ku Klux Klan stopped the game one night. They surrounded the bus, told us, we better not get off. We couldn't play no white team. That's why the Klux did that that night. The white team had a black first baseman, and they, they went berserk about it. Even though with the segregation and all that, we accepted that. We accepted it. We didn't try to fight it because we had no help. Back in that time, states and cities had their own laws. The government wouldn't step in. That reality bred a self-reliance that sometimes turned tribulation into personal triumph. I was in San Antonio, Texas, and I got hit in the head and had to go to the hospital. And they took me at that time down in the basement of the hospital. And they came to see about me whenever they got ready. And it, was, it was a terrible experience. After I came out the hospital, I came up and I hit a grand slam home run. That was the biggest 
accomplishments I had in baseball. We had to overcome a lot of adversity. The conditions, the living under was, wasn't good. The condition traveling wasn't good. But we wanted to play ball so bad that we dealt with it. And they did play ball very well. Some say as well as or even better than the major leagues which would not allow them to compete. But the memories are what mattered today. I pitched back-to-back -back no hitters in Lutheran Stadium. And I led the league in strikeouts in 48 and 49. That was quite an accomplishment. You always enjoy having a good day in the major league park. I hit a home run in Philadelphia, never came down and stayed up in the light tower. And uh, so many that I can name, but you know, you, you forget a lot over the years, but I remember those that they were one in a million. All of it was fun, but I've always mentioned about pitching in, at my hometown against the Major League All-Stars, which was consist of Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, Larry Doby, and uh, even though I gave up a home run to Larry Doby, but it was a lot of fun to be playing against those guys. Just playing against the major leagues was a, was a thing. And playing against a man that we all envied. And we was glad that he was the one that picked to go to the major leagues. That man was Jackie Robinson, the Negro League player who finally broke the major leagues color barrier in 1947. We shouted. We was thrilled for that. But the end of segregated baseball would ultimately mean the inevitable end of the Negro Leagues. In order for black athletes to be elevated, the clubs which sustained them would be destroyed. When, uh, when they got Jackie, then they got Larry Doby, then they got Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, Joe Black, all these guys with the name guys in the Negro League. The Negro League crowd start leaving and they didn't have nobody come to see because all you know everybody wants to see a star they got the best players in the negro league so that was the beginning of the downfall of the negro league but it was the up thing for the guys to really make some money and be recognized for the ball players that they really were most negro league players have remained largely forgotten for half a century they tell their stories today and hope to inspire the next generation of ball players in the process, they're finding new fans. Man, it, this, these guys up here are like really what got me playing baseball. Because people down in the South tend to send us away from baseball, but these guys really keep me going. We try to explain to most of the kids that really understand what we face out here and what we used to face. But I try to tell them that it, all that stigma hasn't left yet. It's still a little bit of it around. To hold us back, but don't let that worry. Keep on pushing. It may be a game, but it was also something more. It was their game. We enjoyed it. We'll go back again doing the same thing. We loved the game, and we would have played on the end of circumstances just like we did. I started when I was 17 years old. I'm 81 years old now. And if I was able to, I would love to try it again. For a brief moment in May at the University of Florida's McKeithen Stadium, they had an opportunity to do just that. Throwing out the first pitch at the University of Florida versus Bethune-Cookman game. Maybe it wasn't just like the old days, but in a way, maybe it was better. For County Update, I'm Alan Yetter. Thank <laughs> you.